Hey everybody, how's it going? So, I was thinking a little bit about a lot of the comments I was getting on the, the additional money, and it kind of, actually a lot of it reminded me of this scumbag negotiation tactic that I wanted to talk about. That can actually work at times, but in my opinion is not great long term. That was employed by somebody who worked with me about seven or eight years ago. Now I remember, this is, this is strange to me, he got somebody to agree to pay about $900 for some, one second, let me just let this thing pass, it's noisy as hell. He's late for his date. Or there's a crime. Or he's late for his date. He'll never know. But anyway, the, there's a, so there was this one person who got somebody to pay about 900 bucks for a three-year-old MacBook. And I thought this is kind of strange. I'm looking over the invoices and I'm just wondering, what did it need? How did you do this? because the average customer is not going to want to pay $900 to fix a three-year-old machine, especially if they got one of the lowest spec machines. So, he was saying, well, the guy needed a new back cover. And this was in one of those H1286s from 2008. I went over it in the, the truth about Apple, uh, the terrible truth about Apple's engineering failures video I did a year and a half ago. This is the machine where the, mach where the back cover with the part that the hinge screws into that the screen's in, instead of it being two, one piece, it's actually two pieces of aluminum that are held together by glue. And the weaker part of it is the part that the hinge goes into. Great design Apple. But uh, above all, the, the best part of this is that the fan exhausts the hot air onto the part that's glued together, ensuring that, even, that the glue will eventually come apart. Because again, instead of having a side exhaust, you've got a rear exhaust, and the rear is where the glue is, and that's where all the weight is being moving back and forth on a hinge. It's just, it's hysterical. But it, it's, it, again, Apple. It is not, I don't design this stuff, I just fix it. And you, you know damn well by this point that uh, whose products I suggest you not spend two or $3,000 on. Jesus Christ, it's loud. Anyway, so, he said, okay, I got the back cover. Then at the same time, it's like, well, while we're in there, you know, it seems like you have a lot of stuff in your desktop. You could probably use a little bit more screen real estate. Would you be open to a higher resolution screen? Maybe you have some more screen real estate. He's like, it's only, how much extra is it? It's this much. And the guy's like, okay, fine. It's only this much. And then he goes, well, it seems like you'd like the machine open a little faster. And he does this, oh, you know, it would cost you this much extra to get this type of drive. And he's like, eh, okay, fine. He's like, well, it seems you have a lot of things open at once. You know, you could have a lot more things open at once if you get this upgrade. Would you open, you open to that? He's like, eh, okay, fine. And the guy had only come in for this one thing, and he winds up leaving spending $900. Now, if you had simply, now, the way it was explained to me is if you had simply said, here's all the things we can do and it would be $900, he would have said no. However, when you break it up into these small little pieces and you get them to make small concessions one at a time, it's actually very easy to get them to agree to spend a lot more than what their original budget was. You can get somebody whose original budget was four and up it to nine because you're, you're only upping it in these $150 or $200 increments that then makes it to them worth putting the money into because it's only one or $200 increments. They don't ever zoom out to see the entirety of the story. And I've always kind of found this to be a scumbag negotiating tactic, and I'll explain why. Is, uh, you know, Jim Camp goes over this and start with no, that when you really push for the hard sale, you know this is what you need. This is the best place for you. This is going to be great. You know it. Like, even if you actually get the person to make the decision, what happens is at some point they're going to do what I call zoom out. They're going to see the big picture, and they're going to say, I went in with a budget of 400 and somehow, that kid just hit that little girl with the striped shirt. That is so fucked up. What an asshole. Anyway. I can't believe you hit it. Look, she's still looking. She's like, I can't believe that kid hit me as he crossed the street. Wow. That was just genuinely mean. Anyway. If, uh, you, you can convince somebody to pay that far out of their budget if you do it in these small increments. And, but the thing is, if you try and negotiate that way, you're going to get people that don't that change their mind at the end so Jim Camp in his book and I'm paraphrasing here because it's been years since I read it but it's an excellent book it's called start with no I highly suggest you read it says that it's like a pendulum and the more that you try to pull somebody over to your side the more the moment you leave the room they're going you know the, the pendulum just gonna fall in the other direction but if you start with no and you say feel free to say no I don't think this is gonna work for you if you push the pendulum away from you then the natural reaction is going to be that the pendulum is pushed back to you and 
if, if this is the way that I would work. You know, I'd say, you know, feel free to say you should probably shouldn't do this or this is too much money. You seem to be frustrated by how slow this is. Now, this is probably way too much money for this, but what do you think of doing that? And if they agree to it, it will actually be something that they long term agree to because you didn't put the idea, you didn't tell them you need to do this. This is the best deal for you. You simply said, hey, I don't think this is going to be something that's in your budget. But but here's, I'm just throwing this out there because what you do is you make it their decision and when it's their decision, the pendulum is not going to go back in the opposite direction right after they make the decision. Where are you going? Where are you going, white car? Exactly, exactly. You do all that work to cut me off and I'm going to pass you, you motherfucker. Anyway, I don't. I love when people like start vrooming right up behind you because they're so impatient when they're on a road where you're, you're going to get stopped by a red light and you're going... You're going to be speed limited to like 15 miles an hour at the end of it anyway. anyway people in New York drive. It always amazes me the way they drive. And I, so the thing that was happening and why I call this a scumbag negotiating tactic is because you've taken somebody who doesn't have the budget and you've actually gotten them to agree to it. Maybe they're weak minded. Maybe you've uh, tried to maybe you've tried to cater to their consumerism or like or take advantage of the ramping of the consumerist mindset or that they really want something they can't afford. But what wound up happening with that gentleman, that was, and by the way, he was very skilled at sales. He was able to sell a lot of stuff that I could never sell, is that I would wind up with a store filled with items that people were not picking up with repairs that they agreed to. So you got the person to agree to spend $900 on a three-year-old device that I couldn't, and you'd brag about the fact that you were able to get that. But do you actually get that money if the person never shows up to pay for the repair because when they actually look at their bank statement when they get home, it's, oh shit, I can't afford that. But then they don't want to have the awkward conversation where they say, you know, I can't afford that. I know I agreed to it, but I have to undo the repair. They know that I'm going to go, oh, come on, you agreed to it. You signed the dotted line. And then they're not going to show up and pick up. So what I had to do after the, we, I wound up parting ways, you know, I said, I don't see a future working with you. I appreciate it. Uh, it's been great, but, but bye, is I would have to call all these people up and I said, listen, I understand you probably agree to something you can't agree to. I could either take these things out or maybe we could work something out where you pay, you know, maybe 50% of the overall price. I'm sorry. And, you know, I, and I wound up working things out amicably with most of the individuals involved. Why are you stopping in the middle of the... What, what, what are you all doing? Why? 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 It's a road. It's not a parking lot. Anyway, the, he has his blinking lights on. I think, so, uh, Paul told me they're called hazard lights, but I've always found them to be, uh, please don't ticket me, bro, I'm just parking in the middle of the, com of a busy street in New York. I, I need to get some, some please don't ticket me, bro, while I illegally park in the streets in New York lights on my bike, because it would make things a lot easier sometimes. But anyway, I would wind up calling them and working everything out with them amicably, because I, you know, that's the thing, you can actually get people to agree to shit, and I'm seeing it from my own YouTube comments, really. Why would you allow thirteen to fifteen thousand dollars to break a deal? How could you dare allow that to break a deal? And one of the ways that I've been able to not be preyed upon with people who have that, or at least what I like to call the, uh, the scumbag negotiating or the scumbag salesman mindset, is I go into it with the zoomed out approach of this is what I'm willing to spend, this is where I'm willing to make my concession. This is where I will say yes, and this is where I will leave the room because what you're offering is ridiculous. And what I do is I work that out before I enter the actual negotiation. The reason I work this out before I enter the negotiation is this way, there's no getting caught by, oh man, I'd really like that, and it's only this much more. Because if it's, oh man, I really like that, and it's only $100 more when I have a $400 budget, and three to five of those things show up, and now I'm paying 900 because, oh, it was only, because that's the thing, it's only $100 more and it's really cool, well, if that happens five times, I'm now I'm now double my original budget. And uh, you know, I had a family member who was in the, the police force, and one of the things that I remember him explaining to me is they had some sort of course. It was some sort of course on how to really, how to try to get rid of bias when it comes to dealing with groups based on sex, race, age, gender, anything like that. And I was thinking, you know, oh brother. But, but when he explained the way the course worked to me, it actually, or what they were explaining, it actually made sense. So the way what he, way he explained it was that if you see somebody go by you, you need to make the decision in your head as to what what you're going to do when you pull that individual over before you actually see who they are. So if you go, I can't believe that person drove past me in the school district at 40 miles an hour, whatever it is, and you think that's insane, even if it's a kind-hearted, you know, 
uh, the redheaded chick from Desperate Housewives or the grandma Sophia from Golden Girls, you are still giving them the, the ticket for the full price, regardless of what they say, even if they're nice to you. Whereas if you say, you know what, that's a really minor infraction, it's just a busted tail lighter. He went through this stop sign, but there's never anybody at this stop sign anyway, and he went through it really slowly. I'm just going to give a warning. Even if you show up and you, and you get there, and it's the scary figure tattooed head to toe with a grrr attitude, you're still just going to give a warning because you made the decision to give them a warning based on their behavior before you actually knew who they were. And this is going to keep you from, uh, from talking yourself out of thing, out of giving a ticket, or talking yourself into giving a ticket when you otherwise wouldn't have given it. And I see it the same way when it comes to the real estate negotiations. If, uh, if I said, you know, this is the most amount of money that I'm willing to spend on a deposit. This is the most amount of money I'm willing to spend on construction. This is the most amount of money I'm willing to spend to be in this location. If I go into it that way ahead of time, it keeps me from making the types of decisions that are bad, but also the types of decisions that are going to make me go bankrupt. And the importance here is that it is a, it is a disciplined system. And the thing is, when it comes to discipline, it's one of those things where it's really important when you're dealing with five figures of money that you not screw or six figure, uh, six figure things, that you not lose your discipline. So, you know, if again, if you're dealing with a diet and it's just, you know, you're 140 pounds and you'd like to be 130 and it's no big deal. One sec. There's a train and it's really loud. Anyway, train's gone. You know, if you're dealing with a diet and you'd like to lose 10 pounds, or you're not really even that overweight anyway, and you decide to have a cheat food every now and then just to, you know, to allow yourself to get through it, that's one thing. But when you're trying to deal with a disciplined system, when it comes to spending uh, what, what could very well, if I make the wrong decision in the wrong location and the wrong concessions, $150,000 to $200,000, you have to have a disciplined framework. Even if you're not being disciplined 100% with the exact dollar amounts here and there, you have to have a disciplined framework. So when I say in my head, this is the amount of money I'm willing to spend on a deposit, and it just kind of gets blown out, the reason I say no is because I want to maintain that disciplined framework so that I don't wind up getting nickeled and dimed by a scumbag negotiating system. So if you look, well, it's a great place, but it has a demolition clause. It's a great place, but it costs a few hundred extra. It's a great place, but they have a non-standard deposit that they're asking for. If you don't have a disciplined framework, one second, there's a train, now it's in the other direction, but this is one that we may be able to beat. Race the train, ladies and gentlemen, race the train. My favorite game. This is why I can't imagine playing video games on Twitch, or like, you know, playing Half-Life or CSGO or Fortnite and shit. But I can play real life games like Race the Train on the bridge. The problem is there's too many bikes here today and they're not actually and they're not pedaling for some reason. So I'm not able to. Oh my god, I gotta pass this guy. There's actually a chance. Race the this the, the front car is to my left. The train has been beaten! Alright, so we can continue. Ain't getting beat by no J train. Anyway, if you don't have a disciplined framework, the problem is is that you'll make those little bit by bit concessions everywhere. And you know it's out of my budget, but it's 15.5, but it's amazing space. It's a demolition clause, but oh no, it's an amazing space. They want a ridiculous deposit, oh, but it's an amazing space. And you have to stay disciplined. If I didn't stay disciplined, again, they were offended by my offer. They came back with an offer of 13.9. I said around 12.8. They were offended by my offer. No, 12.8. No, 12.8. No, 12.8. Demolition clause. No, give me 200k minimum. Same thing with deposit, and the reason we're doing that is we're staying within our discipline framework. Because again, if you go outside that discipline framework, you will walk into a repair shop looking to spend 400 bucks, wind up spending $900, and then realize, motherfucker, this is a $600 computer. I could have bought a better machine than what you fixed for me for $600. For $700, I could have got it upgraded, and instead, somehow, because of this scumbag negotiating tactic, I've agreed to spend $900 on a fucking $600 computer. I don't negotiate that way. I stopped working with somebody when they would, were uh, continuing to negotiate that way and encouraging it, even though they had no commission. 
and I'm not going to fall into that trap when dealing with others. And I realize that most people aren't trained to have this type of disciplined mindset when doing negotiations because they don't work in business. Most people, when it comes to these types of things, are consumers. They're negotiating as consumers. The stakes are lower, but they're also, they're just not used to having these interactions. But, and I see it in my own comment section. You know, again, I, I always ask for opinions. Some people got pissed when I said, you know, some people were fucks. Again, the people saying, I would pay it, I think it's, it's not terrible. I appreciate your criticism. The people saying, Lewis, you're a fucking cheap old piece of shit garbage because you don't want to pay this fuck you. Those are the people that I call fucks. But anyway, I, let's just get off of that for a moment. Uh, I realize that many people don't have that type of, um, that mindset because they have not been put into situations where they need to maintain uh, discipline in negotiations. But if you don't maintain that discipline in negotiations, it's really easy to start blowing out concessions everywhere where it's not necessary. And I zoom out and I see, you know, think about it. What was my budget? Uh, I would like to spend somewhere in the 50,000 to 60,000 range on construction. I would like to spend somewhere in the 20 to $40,000 in key money in terms of moving in. Uh, I'm open to go outside of that by five to 10%, but not more than that. I, um, when it comes to, uh, when it, when it comes to rent, I was looking at 10,000, but if I see a space that's amazing, I'm willing to go outside of that by 20 to 25%. And Alan's method was actually, again, one of the things I like about him, I think he's part of the start with no mindset. Uh, when he showed me this first space, he said, you know, I understand if you don't want this space, we're looking at others, Lewis. I understand if you don't want it, I understand this is a little out of your budget, but just take a look. He wasn't trying to say this is the, this, the space that you need to get for your business. He wasn't saying if you don't get this space, uh, you know, you're going to lose out. This is the only space for you. This is the only space that you're ever going to be able to do anything with. You know, you're not going to find a deal like this. He started out the conversation with me uh, over via text and email saying, you know, the first place we're seeing is probably going to be a little bit outside of your budget. I, you know, feel free to say no. We are going to see other spaces that day. If you tell me that that space is out of your budget, I just wanted to show it to you to have it out there just so that you can get an idea of what's on the market for retail. You know, that's the way you work. You don't show what you don't, you don't show me a space that's 19,000 when I tell you my max budget is at the, you know, 10 to 14 area and then tell me that that, you know, this is as good as it's going to get and then uh, ridicule me for lowballing like, like some people would do. He just said no more blunts for him. I kind of feel bad. He doesn't seem like a gentleman that should be derived his, deprived his blunts. He actually got out of the way when the cars were coming by and uh, when I started riding my bike in the street. Stand up, dude. Many people would not do that. They would just stand in the street and stare at their phone. Somebody get him a blunt. But I heard him say uh, no more blunts for me. Much sadness. Ah, I went the wrong way. Son of a bitch. Walk up the sidewalk. So that's my thoughts on the matter. This thing is, it's very easy for things to spiral out of control. If you don't set your boundaries, your budget, what you're comfortable with ahead of time, it's really easy for it to spiral out of control. And when it does spiral out of control, then there's a fairly high chance that you're going to make a really bad decision. And it's not just going to be one concession. It's going to be many concessions over a long time period. And you have to be careful with that because it can really screw you. So that's it for today. I will see you all later.